Venus. <laughs> she fell in love with the sacred language of celestial bodies. Since then, she has studied and practiced evolutionary and Hellenistic astrology, along with the ageless wisdom of Egyptian, Vedic, and Arabic systems for understanding divine timing and turning points in the natal chart. She's on a mission to bring Queen Luna back from her second class status in the midst of the sun sign hoopla. The moon is actually the mistress of magic who reflects your soul's intention defined by the sun and makes it manifest. Understanding how to harness lunar cycles and the powers of your own natal moon is what makes this astrology lunatic and her natal moon is at the Sabian degree of the prophet, which also helps. Um, and today is actually, um, yeah, it's an important time right now. Wouldn't you say, Lori? Oh my gosh. Yes, I would. I think that uh, we all have been like biting our nails and collectively feeling like the sky is falling. And you really wanted to do the Pluto return uh, conversation. And actually, because I haven't been like deeply studying it, I did so this morning for myself. And I found a glimmer of hope in this incredibly intense time in the world in which we are watching the United States go through the throes of a rebirth. Yeah, that's definitely what it feels like. Um, and thank you for, for giving some language uh, to what's going on. Cause I definitely, you know, the intention of why we do this calls is really kind of an interruption to the regularly scheduled broadcast <laughs> mm -hmm. to kind of, kind of create a crack, if you will, in, in what, in what is being repeated over and over in the collective um, to allow kind of something new to be birthed, um, something ancient, but at the same time, something, it feels new, but it also feels like it resonates from a much uh, truer place within our being, so. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the mainstream narrative, you know, just going on is all about the polarity that's going on right now. And I wrote an article on my blog called The Othering of America, and it really does talk about what's going on beneath the surface. And there's even an astrological reason for the polarity, the othering, I'm calling it, um, you know, that's happening. And it's happening on, I, I mean, I don't want to sound like Donald Trump, you know, I'm Canadian, everybody, but, you know, it's ha it is happening on both sides. I mean, there's othering or demonizing or vilifying or dehumanizing going on on both sides, the left and the right. But, you know, that aside, the United States is literally in a birth canal process. And 2021, the whole year is, is going to be like, the United States is sitting in, a, is in passage through a cosmic birth canal to rebirth itself. And that's because the planet Pluto is returning to the same degree as it was on the birthday of the United States. And I use what's called the Sibley chart, which is 12 degrees Sagittarius rising. If anyone knows astrology, there you go. And I find it to be really an accurate birth chart for the United States. It works like a charm to predict stuff. And so here we are coming back to the same place where Pluto, the god of rebirth, the god of death, the god of transformation, metamorphosis, um, tra and transformation through crisis and conflict. I mean, that's something people don't like to say about Pluto, make it all super sweet and soft, but it's not a soft and sweet archetype. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Pluto is the god of the underworld. You know, he abducted Persephone and he raped her and then his, the mother Demeter went to rescue her. And, you know, he's just basically... You know, even though he's a god of Mount Olympus, he never spent any time there. I mean, he was literally in the underworld. So, you know, we are looking at the United States underbelly. We're looking at, at the world is on looking at the sort of terribly um, exposed time that the United States is going through right now as things that were underneath the surface are showing up. And um, there's a reason for that. It's it's the placement of the, uh, the uh, Black Moon Lilith, uh, mathematical point in the chart of the United States. So there's a reason why this is all being exposed or shown or revealed right now. And uh, yeah, there's good news ahead. In 2022, um, the restart of the United States, the Pluto return, the rebirth looks positive. Believe it or not. <laughs> when is that exact in 2022? It's February 2nd, 2022. And that's the very first time it returns to its exact 
exact birth position of Pluto to its own place in the chart of the United States. However, that is something that will go on for a long time. That will, that whole birth thing that like the, I would say, you know what you could say if you're into the birthing analogy, it's the cervix is fully dilated for the, the cosmic rebirth of the US on February 22nd, 2022. But a fully dilated cervix still doesn't mean the baby's out yet. So the <laughs> baby doesn't pop out until um, 2023, the end of that year really. Um, because what Pluto does is he retrogrades, he goes back and forth, back and forth. And so he'll continue to go back and forth over the same degree um, during the entire year of 2022 into the very tail end of 2023. So it's a process, it's a turning point. Wow, wow. <laughs> Okay, so that really kind of ties in real well so that people have a perspective of kind of what's happening right now. Um, uh, can you also, you were mentioning too, there's a lot going on this week. Um, and you mentioned something with Jupiter and Pluto as well this this yeah, coming yeah there's a, i will talk a little bit about this week as well because everything ties together especially when you bring pluto into the story because you know what pluto is doing now will have bearing on what pluto does in february of 22 and i just saw morgana say that she pulled the ace of cups for the in the in the chat room for the um for the election um that's incredible yes i do think that we're having the ace of cups for the tarot people here is like a rebirth card um so yeah i do think that's what's going on um this year has been very special we had a returning uh, of pluto and jupiter coming together in the sky meeting each other which happens roughly every 13 years but this time in the sign of capricorn which i'm trying to remember but i don't think pluto and jupiter returned to the same place capricorn together for um Quite a long time like more than 200 years but this is a very special time the pluto in the sky meeting jupiter in the sky this year 2020 because it it offers the world and then each of us a, a sense of a kind of like a digging or an excavating of what it is is the meaning of your life what gives you passion what's the core uh real a uh, deep thing that you stand for or care about or wish to bring out into the world because you know Jupiter yeah he's the leader he's the teacher he's the good guy Santa Claus of the zodiac meeting Pluto god of the underworld and they are brothers in Greek mythology but you know Jupiter is um, the guru, the dispeller of darkness, the one that brings the light to the dark. And then Pluto is the darkness and it, energy. He's the underworld. And so when the two of them come together, a lot of things are exposed. We're seeing exposure of the underbelly individually for everyone in their chart. This journey through Pluto meeting Jupiter three times this year. And the dates were April the 4th, June the, oh my gosh, my brain, I think it's June the 30th. And then uh, coming up this next week do i have my transit chart for those babies oh yes coming up on november the 12th june 30th november 12th uh in each of our lives it doesn't have to be an expose <laughs> you know oh my god someone found my dirty underwear you know it's really not like that you know it's in our individual lives depending on where these two come together it's actually very it can be very beneficial it's our, it's a, called a wealth yoga in the hindu tradition so it's a time of, of digging up Pluto's like things under the ground, like diamonds and gemstones and earth and oil. He rules all of the precious metals and minerals and gems. So, you know, you're kind of digging for the gold, right? And Jupiter is this light bringer energy to help you see the way. So each of us could have a wealth yoga or a wealth experience this year. And if you know your natal charts, guys, it's wherever Capricorn is in the chart, which, which of the 12 pie slices or regions of the chart is it happening in so an example is for me it's happening in my 11th house of friends and social networks and great gains from my career i have never been asked more in 2020 to be on other people's shows in my entire career it's suddenly like i'm being brought into larger communities that's my wealth this year right it's a wealth of community new alliances new friendships um, in larger social groups so everyone here will have that new wealth in some area of their lives, but it's Pluto. You have to dig it up. I mean, the oil well is a process, you know, the oil's under the ground, you gotta tap that. Uh, so each of us is given that chance. And so then, you know, for the last pass of the combination of Pluto-Jupiter on November 12th, 
uh, if you go back each of you to June 30th and then April 4th, you might be able to cobble together themes that are repeating and ask yourself, what am I trying to dig up that has absolute juice and light and goodness for me, my passion, my core passion, and you know, that's meaningful, that's really meaningful to me. And so I've been going through a lot of that excavation myself. And, you know, it's turning into a lot of different projects and directions that I didn't see coming as far back as April 4th. So, so I encourage everyone to get their shovel out. (laughs) Yeah, you know, and it's funny, talk about like community. I just, I'm so excited that Morgana's here. Um, (laughs) Hello, I love you both and you're so, so gorgeous. It's so, it's, it's like a reunion because that's actually how Lori and I met. Um, was at the was at one of Morgana's retreats um, in Bali. So so this, this is just exciting that that also this kind of feels a little bit like a a reunion. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm so. also thrilled to see the two of you collaborating. Thanks. You started this. <laughs> I always call her the head witch. Thanks, head witch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Someone just made a comment. Stellium and uh, Wanda said Stellium and Capricorn. Yeah, a very good point to say that. Well, Jupiter and Pluto are in Capricorn. That's a sign that they're joining in. There, there, there's been a, like a, a a real rowdy group group of planets there all year long. Saturn has been there uh, since 2017 December in Capricorn. Um, if Pallas Athena is there right now, the asteroid, which is like. Like it's really like the, the 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 archetypal smarty pants of the zodiac. You know, she often is like lawyerly and uh, strategic and um, and knows things. She's a know it all. So she's joined the gang there right now too. And for a long time, you know, that the pressure of that Capricorn stellium has been felt by the collective because Capricorn is the status quo. It's what we have as it is and as it always has been and as we think it shall always be. And, uh, you know, it includes government, it includes uh, the, the monetary system and the economic system. But I don't really think that, you know, because of this um, pending Pluto um, birth for the United States, that the way the Constitution is will be the way the co- Constitution will morph into. Like, in other words, the United States Constitution is almost treated like the Torah. You know what I mean? Or for the Jewish tradition or like the um, sacred Bible or whatever. And it was a document that was created, in my humble Canadian opinion, for a time and a place in history. And so I think what we may see as well, it's not just like forms that on the surface that change within the U.S. uh, over the next three years, you know, but I think we're going to see constitutional amendments that we would never have seen coming. And, you know, you got to thank Donald Trump for creating the chaos level you know, honestly, um, that has, uh, and everyone remember, I am a Canadian, so you can't point the finger and tell me that I'm a, a Democrat, I'm not, but we, we have chaos, and chaos will create change, and the founding of the United States is the Constitution, and so the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, all of those things, they're definitely looking at um, being impacted by the rebirth of a nation, and we don't have a lot of, you know, contemporary nation rebirth the experiences to go through. It's kind of tough that way to look at it. Uh, you know, we don't often have real birth dates of, of nations because the United States is particularly well documented. We, know, we can use a chart like the Sibley. So in a human life, Pluto return to Pluto doesn't happen because Pluto takes like 200 and oh my God, how many years? 40 something years to go around the Zodiac. So we never see it with real people, but we can see it with a nation, which will be kind of cool. Yeah, so it it is. It it definitely puts um puts a perspective on it. So um, Lori is willing to answer questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, I just ask that they be more kind of global in nature, that they can be helpful to to everyone who's on the call. Um, yeah, and and I, and I want I want to say one thing before I do take questions because I, I as I said to you guys you know there's a glimmer of hope in the United States chart I want to say why and I don't think any other astrologers have pointed this out yet um, there's a formation as a precise moment of the of the return of Pluto on February two two thousand and twenty two which is an initiatory energy 
of a kite in the sky. A kite is an astrological grand aspect pattern and it promises success and it promises goodness and it's full of sextiles and trines and it's very harmonious. And so the beauty there is that it's also a moksha kite. It's made up of uh, water signs, which means it's about liberation, the soul. Soul freedom, going deeper, um, moving beyond the surface. I mean, in a human person's life, you know, the moksha or water um, triplicity or signs, if you have a lot of planets in there, you're going to spend a lot of your life looking for truth, God, enlightenment, uh, waking up, awakening, spirituality. And suddenly the U.S. is rebirthing with this beautiful kite that has that gorgeous water trine in it, that that liberation, that soul kite, you know. So I think what we're going to see is also a, a, a real return. And then Uranus is playing a part as well. He's at the tip of the kite. Uh, so an invention, uh, uh, innovation, um, new technology, new um, systems of thought, um, rebellion of course because it's uranus but you know the, the feeling that the anchored energy of the beginning of this do do birth is coming has this deeply spiritual underpinning like really soulful and that that that's not about religion right that's not about beliefs and personal philosophies it's something far deeper that the united states is coming into contact with in 2022 and 2023 and i keep waiting for the aliens to land on the white house lawn because i think that would that would do the trick <laughs> <laughs> I really do. What does your chart say about the whole QAnon thing? Um, that is Neptune. And uh, and yes, it will be a recording. Someone asked that in the comments. Um, Neptune is the purveyor of delusion, illusion, fantasy, cults, um, false gurus, when he's not doing enlightenment. Uh, you know, he has quite the range. And um, Neptune is back in Pisces, uh, and it's exactly in the same position, basically, that going through Pisces as it was uh, in 1860. And in fact, Neptune was in Pisces from 1848 to 1860. And if some of you guys don't know your American history, uh, when that happened, um, there was the beginning of a new movement called the spiritualism or spiritualist movement, which involved talking to the dead and was primarily... Um, instigated by women. And by the time you got to eight, which Neptune did, Neptune and Pisces, that's where Neptune is today. It hasn't been in Pisces. Also around the time of the Civil War. And then the Civil War in 1860, exactly. And what happened was that Neptune was still in Pisces during the time that Lincoln was elected and it caused a huge uproar. So um, succeeding, state seceded from the nation and the, it germ germinated the Civil War. Um, I. I do feel that that Neptune position has a similar overlay in this time. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, and Chiron is also playing a part in this kind of wounded, this wounded nation story. Uh, Chiron and Aries right now with Mars in dignity. Mars hasn't been in Aries for six months since 1988, July of 88 to January of 89. And now we're getting another dose of this. Mars is so close to earth, everybody. That it's the brightest it's ever gonna be. It's peaking in its brightness, and when a planet like Mars, the warrior, peaks in its brightness, it's brighter than Jupiter in the sky right now, which is really rare. And it peaks in its brightness uh, till mid-November. It started peaking in October. That means Mars, which is war, anger, animosity, conflict, de uh, debate at the best, um, name calling and shouting at the worst. And of course, unfortunately, riots and violence as well. Uh, when Mars is that close to Earth and that bright in the sky, some of the more difficult parts of Mars are prominent. And you add to that, that um, Mars is retrograde, which is not good for Mars acting in particularly noble fashion for the collective. Individually, it's fine. You could get really into your Zen inner warrior, but for the collective, Mars can act uh, out of accordance with the noble heroic archetype of the warrior and more with the stealth, the plunder, you know, the, you know, the darker sides of that. So we were, we were, we're in the middle of it now, but it's Neptune Morgana that is the QAnon driver. Okay, is there so- an expiration date when everybody gets sane again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Mars is going direct on November 15th. That'll take the heat off some of the, I think off some of the intentions, uh, sort of the intensity around like people boarding up businesses on the eve of the election. That's so retrograde Mars, close to earth, super bright. Um, and then the, the other happy ending is Jupiter is uh, the Jupiter can help the story. I mean, Jupiter's Santa Claus of the Zodiac, but he's got half his reindeer sick out with COVID right now. So he's really not working as, uh, as well as he should. 
that's because he's in Capricorn, the sign of his fall. But Jupiter leaves Capricorn on December the 20, oh, the 19th or the 8th, 17th. I always forget. And then whew, he can sort of help mitigate some of that intensity that we're experiencing, especially with the Mars piece. So we're, we're all kind of seeing some lightening up as, as we move towards January, for sure, for sure. Oh, and one more thing. And the day that the electors meet in the United States to do the, uh, the, the, the vote for the election, I just was looking at that chart earlier and I'm like, oh, there's an eclipse on that day. And I'm really, I'm expecting there to be quite the interesting developments because an eclipse on the day that the electors meet on December 14th in the United States, um, there's a star that's associated with the stinger of the scorpion playing out. And so I guess it could just be that there's a lot of, I, I don't know if you guys know this, electors can choose not to vote in the uh, manner in which they are elected to vote in the electoral college. There may be a few um, abstainers and it might just make a big shocking news story, but I do think the electoral vote will go ahead with its um, promise of what looks like a Biden president elect right now. It would be very hard for them to throw it. A lot of states mandate by law that they have to vote for the people's will. Yes, yes. Because exactly. of the last election. Exactly. I, I agree with you. I don't think it's going to throw it because I think that uh, at the end of the day, there's going to be enough electoral votes that it's not like hinging on two, two radical abstainers or whatever. But what, one of the things I will say before we take questions is that there's no rationality here right now. Um, so a lot of what was missed in this election in terms of the close call is the, not the enthusiasm of the Trump supporters, but the fanaticism. And a lot of the Trump election was negative polarity and demonizing the Democrats, right? So, you know, demonizing literally that, that, they, that they're evil. And, and so that brought up this kind of frothy, zealotry, almost religious ardor and fanaticism amongst his, a lot of his um, fan base. And that is why the election is so close. That's why it is not like um, a blue, super blue wave or something. Yeah. Anyway, I'm okay with questions too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Wanda yeah. is wondering, how do we trust, respect, and find honesty in our everyday moment, I suppose, in a climate like this? That's a really good question. I have a little saying I repeat to myself. I think we all have to find our inner center. And I used to uh, be into the Bible when I was a teenager. And I always say to myself this uh, expression from the Bible, I think it's Corinthians, but I'm not religious, so I don't know. But it's, um, you know, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to her purpose. <laughs> I always change that up. Uh, and my feeling is, is that I try to see there's a divine a tapestry that's being woven. And yeah, right now in the middle of it, it looks like there's like this gaping, like missing piece, or there's, you know, the design looks pretty ugly or something, but you know, I don't have the big picture. I don't have the divine overview. Well, astrology gives me overviews like, wow, look at that kite in January. I mean, in like February 2022, maybe this country is going to birth into some spiritual icon or something. Um, that kind of thing gives me perspective, but I don't have that to soothe me in the moment, right? Then the mo each moment is its own moment. So I find that the moment is best finding your own inner sort of anchor, whatever that may be, whatever brings you that sense of the universe is a friendly place, you know, trusting the universe. Thank you. I got to fly around me. If it lands on my head, I'm going to. I'm going to do a Mike Pence redo. <laughs> um, okay, I saw a couple different people with their, I see Shauna with her hand up, but I thought I saw Shelly with her hand up. Um, Shelly, if you still have your hand up, um, do you want to unmute yourself? Thanks so much, Demetria. I, I was just asking, I was going to ask Lori uh, the same thing that Morgana asked, and that was when we're going to see sanity, if, if we're going to see that soon if the you know the violence etc is kind of near near future view and morgana kind of asked that and i think laura you pretty much answered that yeah well you know some of the intensity that's going on right now 
um, has been the, the transit of Venus as well through the sign of justice. Now that's actually her place. She's in Libra right now. And she's happy in Libra. I mean, she's, it's her home one of her two home signs, but because a lot of what the intensity is on the game board is, um, is these lawsuits, right? That the, um, the Trump base is hoping will prevail. In some way, they haven't given up yet. So I do anticipate that there will be a, sort of more trigger points coming up uh, over the next two or three weeks. But one of the clear turning points in the sky is around November 11th. And that is because on November 11th, and then we do have a, a, also a 12, I mean, a moon coming up, a new moon, but separate from that for a sec. On November the 11th, there's this particular formation with Venus that is extremely promising uh, for some kind of do justice in the collective, especially around what's going on with lawsuits. It's maybe something to do with the Pennsylvania ruling where there's a 4-4 tie and uh, it was not to allow votes to be counted past uh, the, the election day, etc. And I don't know that even the election would hinge on that. So I'm not sure what justice thing is going to happen. But um, Amy Coney Barrett's chart looks like she's a true spiritually be a true spiritual being and a bit of a chameleon, and I think that she is not going to tow the party gamesmanship line for which she was chosen by the GOP. Now, the thing that's happening on the sky November 11th for everyone here, because it's not just for the U.S. chart, is it's Venus is going to be at the tip of a finger of God. You know what's so really cool? Somebody sent this to me today. Somebody sent me a Venus statue made out of soap. I mean, like really? And I'm in the middle of investigating the Venus point on the finger of God. So there's a finger of God in the sky. And what Venus is going to do is she's going to open up some kind of can of worms in the judicial or legal area uh, that will point to some kind of divine resolution. So it's involving Jupiter, it's involving Mars, it's involving Mercury and Black Moon Lilith. Uh, so Black Moon Lilith is the underbelly, the shadow, the darkness, the place we don't want to look. But it's also that sort of sense of um, where we want to get right the wrongs as well. You know, like Lilith was, you know, the first wife of Adam, mother of demons, supposedly, but that was a patriarchal slur on her. So we could see that some kind of writing of a wrong coming from the feminine, Black Moon Lilith and Venus. I think it's Amy Coney Barrett around the 11th is gonna surprise everybody by ruling with what probably is uh, Justice Roberts, whatever he's up to. He's pretty well got his head on his shoulders and there won't be a uh, success in a, uh, what's the word I want? Like in a um, success in an underhanded um, way. You know what I mean? There won't be any kind of a sense of the whole of the collective being in a sense of chagrin and despair, because as soon as the court is a bot court, you know, as soon as the Supreme Court is a bot court and everyone in the world sees that, the United States is really in trouble. So I think there's a glimmer of light that comes in then around the November 11th time frame. Okay, interesting. You know, I was thinking about that finger of God, um, you know, and that's like that where it makes that triangle, right, in a chart. Yeah, it looks like it looks like an arrowhead. Yeah, and so you're saying that that's going to be at the very tip of, of the finger of God for the for the United States, or no, no, Venus is at the tip. Of, no, it's Venus is at the tip of the finger of God on November 11th for the whole world. It's just a four in the heavens. Yeah, and and so the idea is that Venus is in Libra, where is is all about the scales of justice. And so, in essence, we know that whenever this finger of God points at, it has to do with justice. In your individual life, it could point to romance, but I mean, for the collective right now, we're, it's going to be about something in the legal system. Interesting. Interesting. Well, um, Shauna has her hand raised. Um, would you like to unmute yourself, Shauna? Yes, thank you. Um, I obviously re realize the election here in the U.S. is a, is a big global issue. But the issue that is coming to my heart and mind today that I also feel I have a purpose in somehow and am very passionate about is family. And what I've seen in the last, I guess I would say 12 years since I started my own family and, and it really became something that I was more conscious of is abandonment within the family, whether it be physical or whether it be emotional. And I'm just curious, this astrology thing is all new to me, but I'm just curious, you know, I, of course, I've got my perspective on what makes a, uh, 
a healthy family, but is there a shift of some sort that is, is there a breakdown in the family going on right now? And from that breakdown, there could be a breakthrough. I, I just see so much pain in families. Hmm. I wonder if that's true globally, Shauna, or if that's a condition, let's say, of, you know, the Western world or, or a condition of the North American climate. Um, I mean, I don't mean climate, climate, I mean emotional climate. Um, every, every location on the planet has its own sort of astrological signature. And I mean, I, I spend time in Mexico and I don't see that breakdown there at all amongst the, I know what you're talking about, but I don't see that there. And when I talk about the United States, it's also different than, than it is in Canada although we're close enough that themes do overlap on the map of astrology. Um, in general, when we're looking at things to do with the family, we're looking at the moon, but the moon is a big, fast moving body. And so it's very changeable. Um, I, I think that if we're looking at fractions, fractioning uh, family, I think we're looking at, again, this rebirth of something new with all of those planets in Capricorn this year, the status quo asking for, um, mm -hmm. They're kind of going through their last gasp, right? I mean, Saturn since 2017, Pluto since 2008 during the um, fiscal disaster in the United States with a um, with the collapsing uh, bank loan scandal. So these planets are going through a place of status quo, but the ultimate destination is transformation. So when I think about the Western world, particularly North America and families, I think there is there has been too much. Um, focus on nuclear family at the expense of extended family. And what I see is people forming family communities outside of family, like living together in group homes, creating sustainable, uh, you know, organic farming collectives and stuff. I, so I do think in a way, we're not going to go back. I don't think we're going to suddenly have grandma and everybody living with us and, you know, and cousins living next door and which is more European, I think what we're headed for with this, this astrology as well is a breaking down of the current systems for something new to come. And it's about community. And I can say that with a reason. It's that Saturn will meet with Jupiter in the sky, it, the two planets. That fly is going to drive me crazy on, De on December 21st, 2020. It's called the conjunction of kings and it's happening in the air sign of Aquarius and the whole world is waiting an astrology world for that because it hasn't happened in that position for 700 years or so at that degree in Aquarius the two come together and, and Aquarius is about community and so Jupiter is let's expand grow faith hope optimism uh, it go big or go home and then Saturn is scaffolding structures form ways to make it real Saturn's the Lord of time, the Lord of space. And so we're looking at a new kind of community for the whole world, a sense of how we're going to work together in community. You know, all the air signs are signs about relatingness. Gemini is self to self, you know, inner, inner self stuff. Um, you know, Libra is self to other, which is why it rules justice as well, plaintiff and defendant energies. Uh, and then Aquarius is a part of the whole like we are one can we get together and that old coke thing i want uh, the world uh, uh, to place perfect harmony when i was a kid there was a coke commercial that's so aquarian it's just so aquarian and so we're all going to see new forms of community form that may supplant the old forms of having the family of origin or extended family as your community we're going to find like soul fam as they say in the new age community so that's my take on it can see that happening, the soul family versus the extended family that you were born into. I can totally see what you're saying there. What, what, and I hate to use this word, but it's the only word that comes up for me. You got the traditional, and I'm not even saying traditional as in man and woman, but let's just say traditional as in two parents and then children. Let's just word it that way. That's where I see a lot of the breakdown. And do we just wait until the 20th of December? Um, do we take action? I mean, it feels like there's just a lot of force going on trying to get two people to work together in, a, in an immediate family. Does that make sense when I say that? 
Yeah, it, well, it may, it may be your experience for sure. I mean, I'm, I haven't seen that like breaking down between the parents' story. Um, I, I, not in my life or those I know who, who have separate families for their children. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with parents breaking up. It's, you know, there's studies that show that two parents who break up or stay together has no bearing on a child's psychological welfare. It's whether those parents either together or apart are harmonious with each other. And that's all that matters. And if, if the, they're together and they're arguing or they're apart and they're arguing, it's the same effect. So I don't think there's any need to change what it is. I, I mean, if we're talking about why your family is not staying together, I think that the soul's evolutionary impulse is trumping the matrimonial uh, bond that is created for, actually, if anyone knows anything about the institution of marriage, it has to do with chattel. It has to do with property. It has to do with owning and possessing land. And, and, and it's really a patriarchal model anyway. So I'm not even down for the patriarchal model of holy matrimony till death do us part. So I'm not sure what your question is. I, I think my experience really has been very positive with, with, with divorce and those people that I'm communicating with in my client base, most of them. Um, does that answer your question, Shauna? I wasn't, were you, were you talking about parents um, staying together or were you talking about like parents and children? I wasn't sure. Yeah, I wasn't well, sure. I think it gives me a perspective. I mean, it gives me an opinion, which I appreciate because what, what I just see, I, I actually see a lot of selfishness, a lot of, this is my perspective, mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, we brought these children into the world and whether the parents stay together or whether they divorce is irrelevant, but I see a lot of men and women um, leaving their children to go pursue careers yet somehow the children that were brought into the world are no longer as valuable as the idea of bringing them into the world was. So the responsibility, once you got beyond the newness of, oh, look at my child I brought into the world, taking that responsibility from birth to, you know, allowing the child to be self-reliant, I just see a lot of uh, selfishness and a lot of people just sort of walking away from that responsibility like somehow career is more important when in my mind I think they're both important and need to be uh, in harmony or balanced I mean both of them are responsibilities mm -hmm. and I don't see that happening as much as I did um, when I was younger Hmm. You know what? Pluto's in Capricorn since basically December of 2007. And that's about the established ways that things have been. And he hasn't been there for like, you know, uh, since the 18, well, 1700s. So, you know, Pluto is going through to destroy the old ways. But the good news is he pops out the other end and it includes family structures and, and priorities. He pops out in 2023 and he tiptoes a little bit into Aquarius where he's going to bring new forms of community while he journeys through Aquarius. Okay. So I would say that, you know, looking at the bigger picture is that, you know, that all it takes a village to raise a child. We may be headed for more of that. We really may be. And, and I get it. I don't like Cheryl Sandberg's lean in because it says abandon your children and lean into the boardroom. It almost feels like that women had to man up. And I think that where we go again is where does divine, does the divine feminine return to the planet in any kind of meaningful way? And Black Moon Lilith is about, Black Moon Lilith is about the disqualified, discarded feminine. And so she's a part of the US chart. She's exactly opposite the US moon, the masses, the populace. And she's a big part of that kite that's coming up as well, uh, as well as this finger of God in the short term. So I, I would say to everybody, you know, patience, like these are epochs we're moving through, you know, these are like huge sea changes for the whole world. I, I mean, there's nothing like the fact that the planet might just like give up the ghost before our very eyes and we're gonna be stranded on a sterile planet than, than to put us together in the name of the, you know, the, the, the Gaia herself. So let's just hope, let's just hope we can see the light. I really do think we need a UFO on the White House, House lawn, but short of that, I think seeing the planetary um, convulsions with the climate is going to be enough to hopefully reorient our collective priorities. Um, I'm just hoping. Mm, thank, thank you. you. Welcome. And thank you, Shauna. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, Lori, you've just touched on so many things. I just want to kind of like regroup here. <laughs> I'm just trying to like soak in a lot of this. Um, you know, I mean, so many topics uh, are coming up, like everything from like the relationships with the family to what's going on in our politics. 
um, to UFOs, to, <laughs> to our entire global climate, climate. And you know, it's like, before I just, I'm gonna take one last question before we part, but before I do that, um, I, can you kind of connect those dots for us? Because I think they're powerful. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna try, okay? <laughs> a feeling that we're due for like an intervention you know what I mean of some sort and I don't know what the intervention is I call it a divine intervention I think that the way the planet is going looks really uh like nothing much will change except maybe just you know it's like here's the manuscript of humanity here's the story and we're going to change the font I don't think so that's where we're going we're just tinkering with the font and I think that there's going to be more like an intervention event now I don't know what that is and I know that Uranus will be the planet Uranus in Taurus is going to be a part of that. I kind of joke about uh, the UFOs and all that and aliens, but I almost feel like that could be more about my feeling underneath the surface that something extra terrestrial or extra uh, homo sapiens sapiens ish is going to show up in our awareness. I don't know why. I just feel it. It sounds crazy. And I think in the next two years, that pivot of, oh my God, we're not alone in the universe is going to be enough to galvanize for, well, it, it will disrupt a lot of religious belief, I'm sure, but it will galvanize a different orientation for humanity. We all need to take our eyes collectively in a new direction. And you know, you think about the 1960s um, when everybody was excited about the moon and going to the moon and you know, woo, and all the astronauts and the all of that stuff. That was an interesting time. And I do think that we're going to experience some kind of excitement again around something like that. I don't know what it is. I really don't, but I do feel it. So there's that in divine intervention around the collective focus. And I think Uranus will be the agent for it. And that kite for the US return of its Pluto, it has Uranus at the tip of the kite. So there's more of that. Um, unexpected. Uranus is the unexpected, the bolt of light, the, the aha, the the super surprise, you know, way outside the lines of what you think is going to be possible. Um, and then when we tie in the other themes that we talked about, about collective community, it, this has been said by many astrologers with the movement of, you know, the Aquarian age seemingly heralded right now by the conjunction of kings in an air sign for the first time in 200 years and the first time in almost seven or 800 in Aquarius zero degrees, there is a huge way we're going to, no matter what country you're in, there's a way we're all going to start to reorient toward what is community, what is belonging, what is collaboration. And with that comes new technology to facilitate that because Aquarius and, and all of that can be very much about the technological revolution. Um, I'm like, yeah, that's what I think. And next year, the whole year of next year is a, a Saturn and Uranian year. So Saturn is the status quo. Uranus is the thunderbolts and the lightning that shatter the status quo and the stayed and the tried and true. And that Uranus Saturn contact that goes over the entire year of 21, it's really shattering shattering the, the way we think things are. So that's just my hunch anyway. I, again, I, my hunch, I keep pointing to something like UFOs, but maybe it's even someone discovers an asteroid moving through the solar system that they go take pictures of and realize it's an encrusted spaceship. <laughs> it doesn't have to be something landing here. There's just something that's gonna share, the collect that's gonna awaken the collective imagination and put us in an orientation to put our paltry small differences aside. Oh man, that just felt so alive. Ooh, all my cells just, they like, they're smiling. <laughs> yeah, I got the same feeling when you said that, but I do think that's what's going to happen. You know, we're all humans and then we're all souls, you know, we're all divine sparks and then we're all just happen to be in a human form. So when we start breaking down things like, uh, you know, you're different than me because X, mm -hmm. Y, Z, you know, then we're so losing our way. I. I just want to like ring that, you know, I just want to like sound the bell. <laughs> like, yeah, it's going to be something that's going to come in. Yes, yeah, like a divine intervention coming in where, you know, putting our paltry differences aside and we will see the picture. The picture will be clear of why we're here and who we are. So I absolutely love that. I'm going to wrap it up here um but i will take are you okay with one last question Lori? before of we course yeah absolutely okay, so maybe katie can you unmute yourself thank you <laughs> i'm from germany and i would like to know uh if 
uh, next week from the 11th to the 15th and the 16th of December would be a good time to start new projects. Yeah, I, if you, it depends on your chart, my dear, like what's going on there. Um, Mars is retrograde and that's not necessarily the best time, depending on where it is in your chart, to get action going on a project. But if you're just planning, thinking and um, tinkering with stuff, great. But Mars retrograde is the, the action god. And he's so slow in the sky right now, he's stationing to turn around on December the 14th, 15th. And so um, you would be best to wait until after mid-November to get some more significant momentum. And plus there's a new moon coming up in the middle of the month. And right now we're in what's called a waning moon. The light is going darker and darker and that's never a good time to start something. So wait till after the new moon, I'd say, and wait till after Mars goes direct. And, um, and then things are a lot uh, easier in initiating or starting something new. And is that Mars goes direct November 15th? Is that what you said? Yeah, I think, well, I think he's stationing on the 14th, actually. I mean, I don't have my Mars calendar in front of me, um, but he's, it's mid-month, yeah. But I think it's on the 14th he's stationed. Stationary Mars just means he, he's going to turn around, like not really because the planet doesn't, doesn't go backwards, but on our perspective from Earth, it looks like he goes backwards, 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 then he stops or stations. So he's turning around around November 14th, 14th. And really during those that whole week until about November 21st, it still looks like he's staying still. He's just micro moving, but he's changing his view. He's turning his head in another way into a, a forward direction. So that's why I'm saying to our questioner, wait until Mars is at least facing in the right direction. <laughs> right now he's looking backwards. You want to have him looking forward because he's your action hero. And you know, he gets things going, things, your ambition, your drive, your action is fortified when he's direct. That is super helpful. Does that help, Katie? Yes, uh, because I have a very important interview the 16th of December. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, yeah, you're, you've cleared the new moon as well. So yeah, run with that. That should be very good for you. And, you know, also remember that there's nothing that you can do that's going to be a mistake in life. I think that people like think sometimes that astrology is about all these rules of when you should do something or not. Um, I don't look at it that, that way, really. Uh, it's more opportune to wait. But if you didn't wait or something happened sooner, something something else would happen that would be good. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny with astrology that way. I don't think we can really use it to avoid mistakes as much as to look at where the the, the, the most fertile, flowing, and, and light-filled path is. If that fly lands in my head, I'm going to do it in a, a total Mike Pence moment. I have... <laughs> Fly flying around my kitchen. I haven't had that. I don't know since when, but I opened all the doors and windows today. So. <laughs> this is one of those moments. I know, but do you see it? Like, I'm like, oh, would you please stay clear, you stupid thing? It's like, oh, right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I love it. I mean, this is so chock full of wisdom. So yeah, I think it will be necessary to listen to the replay um, to really kind of soak in some of the wisdom that has come through. Uh, any final words, Lori, uh, before we before we part for the day and bid everyone a very uh, powerful weekend? <laughs> yeah, don't get caught up in being fearful here. I just was looking at somebody talking about the gates of vaccines and pesticides and the questions or whatever in the, in the comments section. Um, you know, huh? You know, it sounds like a cliche, but if we're if we're anchored in anxiety, fear, and um, you know, despair, uh, that we generate that field around us. And uh, if we can just, just flip it, do your best. Like you know, find your gratitude uh, where you can. Um, we each are like little lights in the in this. We're little. We each of us are sparks of light. That's all we are. You know, the, the Judaic tradition is that we're sparks of light. And if we're sparks of the divine light. And we're fearful. That is going to be like putting the candle on the dimmer switch on our light, dimmer switch like electrically. And uh, and I and I find it my practice right now, right, is my morning practice that keeps me from falling into anxiety, despair, or fear. I get up in the morning, I sit in my window seat, I close my eyes, put my coffee in my hand, and I listen to that still voice within. So all I can say is right now, any advice for anybody would be um, just turn the TV off. You know, I mean, I'll tell you, Biden will make the will make it if that you're if you, that's what you're worried about and find the light in you and light it up a little bit more because then you shed that light outward just even going to the grocery store with a frustrated clerk wearing their mask exhausted because they had a mask on all day 
you know, interacting with that person. How are I asked, how are you doing? How's it, how's it going for you right now? Are you okay? I always ask every store clerk that question. I want to know how they are. I want to share that I feel that they're in a difficult place, that they're working here in a pandemic. So you know what I'm saying? Share your light and 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 find the place of peace and stillness in within. I, I love that you closed it with that because that's come up in previous calls. Something so simple and maybe probably the most profound thing you can do today is say hi to someone. Say mm -hmm. hi to a stranger, you know, make conversation with them. It doesn't have to be long, but it just, it could completely turn around someone's day mm -hmm. when you actually acknowledge their presence. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. so simple, isn't it? <laughs> and, and it takes you out of your own shit, really, because, you know, they may come back with, I'm doing great, but sometimes they tell me, oh, it's really been really hard. And, and you know, and they're having a difficult time about something. And, you know, then I feel grateful that someone listened. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, Lori, thank you so much for this. I would love to have a part two if you're willing to play again. I would love to. You know what I said to I said to you, Demetria, ages ago. You need to have. You are a natural born uh, host, like you, you know, interviewer uh, type of person. You could be. You could be an anchor desk and slash. You know broadcast person, you know, you're really, really good. So I hope you really develop this outward and go big and go really with this thing that you do so well, which is interview people. Oh, thank you. That means so much. And I will take that. I receive that and I'm going to water those seeds. <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you everyone until we all meet again. Oh, hi Gail. My friend Gail Lawson is here. Hi Gail. <laughs> what a great group. Well, I know amazing group that, that came and definitely tune in for the replay. We'll both be sending that out. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. Bye. Thank you. Namaste everyone.